It's the things we love most that destroy us. It's official, I am back in my Hunger Games era. Kristen here, and I'm obsessed with the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Of course, I had to go back and rewatch all the Hunger Games movies, and I gotta say, there's so many moments that just have a deeper meaning now, having watched this film. So let's talk about it. Starting off with White Roses, we know that Coriolanus's grandmother grew these on the rooftop of their apartment, and that his mother always smelled of roses. So we often see him wearing a rose to really connect to his mother and to his family. We see him meet Lucy Gray and bring her a rose as sort of like a, a way to garner trust. And he even gifts her his mother's shawl, which smells of roses. In The Hunger Games, Peter makes a joke that everyone in the capital smells like roses because of the showers, and he and Caesar Flickerman kind of do a little sniffy sniff, and they're like, oh yeah, we do, we smell like roses. Do I smell like roses to you? Um, I, all right. Mm, do, I, yeah, do I smell like? And then decades later, as president, this has remained Snow's signature. He leaves white roses for his enemies before he kills them. I mean, you even see him drop a huge bomb of roses on Katniss. This is also where we learn that poison is Snow's weapon of choice, from rat poison to spiked morphling. And in The Hunger Games from Mockingjay Part 1, I thought there was this really interesting line where they say that Snow uses poison because it's the perfect weapon for a snake. Poison, perfect weapon for a snake. And I was like, ooh, just another layer to the title of this film. Speaking of morphling, Dean Highbottom is often seen abusing the drug and his addiction is how he ends up getting poisoned by Snow. In the original franchise, we see Joanna and Gail each have to use morphling and we briefly meet two tributes from District 6 that are addicted to the drug and they're called the Morphlings. One of them even helps Peta survive. While the Dean of the Academy and creator of the games, Casca Highbottom, is not a fan of Coriolanus, game maker Dr. Volumina Gall is very intrigued by Snow's ideas for the games. Snow suggests that the Capitol gets to know the tributes and offer sponsorships and really root for them and be invested, which helps him both get ahead and also gain Lucy Gray's trust. In fact, it's thanks to him that viewership rises and the games ultimately begin to elevate to the glamorous reality show of a battle royale that we know them as decades later. And while Katniss and Peeta are giving training and wardrobe and press team 64 years later, Lucy Gray and the other tributes are locked in a human zoo being gawked at given no food, no training, no way to really prepare for this. After Lucy Gray performs to bring in sponsors during the games, Lucky says to her, I don't love your odds, but may they be in your favor, which refers to the phrase that Effie Trinket says, may the odds be ever in your favor. There are, of course, several references to Katniss in this film. The most obvious being when Lucy Gray bows at the reaping, just like Katniss did in training. We also get to see the origins of the Hanging Tree song, which Lucy Baird writes and ultimately becomes a song of rebellion for Katniss and the people of Pan Am. We met up at midnight in the hanging tree. And it's so fascinating to just see her in comparison to Katniss. Like they are the polar opposites. And Rachel Zegler has even said this, her character is a performer that has to learn how to fight, whereas Katniss was a fighter who had to learn how to perform in order to survive. Knowing the future of what happens in the Hunger Games, her presence is just such a vessel for change that it's so captivating to watch. When Snow goes down to the arena to retrieve Sejanus after Marcus's death, you can even see the camera pan and show a bow and arrow in the rubble as an homage to Katniss and her weapon of choice. While on the lake, a member of the covey brings a plant to Lucy Gray. She explains to Snow that this is a swamp potato, but she prefers to call it Katniss because it has a nice ring to it. When Lucy Gray performs at the hob with the covey, she spins just like Katniss did in her transformational dresses made by Cinna. Even something as simple as Lucy Gray being like, okay, Snow, I'm gonna go leave this cabin. I'm gonna go bring back some Katniss, you know, the potato plant. It's just, it's like a bullet. And in a paranoid state, he goes out to find her and shoots at her. This felt like a parallel moment to me in Catching Fire. Before Katniss shoots at the dome in the games, she's given a chance to shoot Finnick. But because of the trust that they've formed over the course of this film, she foregoes that opportunity and instead ends up taking down the entire dome. Eagle-eyed fans will even notice that Lucy Gray's famous colorful dress even features images of Katniss and Primrose plants and interwoven snakes. Which begs the question, who really is the songbird and who really is the snake in this story? I think both Lucy Gray and Snow are both. Snow might be snake-like in his quest for power 
and his choice of weapon, but he also relates to terms associated with songbirds, like an informer, an accuser, and a snitch, especially when he betrays Sejanus. Meanwhile, they call Lucy Gray the poor songbird in the capital, but she has some snake-like qualities as well. Aside from her own dress, she puts a snake down her enemy's dress during the reaping, and there are at least two different times when she claims to have calmed snakes down by her singing. If she can control snakes, does that mean she's able to control Coriolanus? That fight for power between them and lack of control leads to that break in trust that changes changes everything and haunts Coriolanus for life. Mockingjays are another symbol of rebellion in this series, and this is where we first get introduced to them. While Jabberjays were meant to spy on the districts, they ended up mating with Mockingbirds and creating Mockingjays. Lucy Gray ends up pointing them out to Snow, and we get to really see how haunted and disoriented he is by them when they echo Lucy's voice singing The Hanging Tree. Looking back at the older movies, we get to see Katniss and Finnick have a similar reaction when they become distraught hearing the screams of Prim and Annie through the voices of the Jabberjays. Between the name Katniss, the Mockingjay pin, and the birds, and the Hanging Tree song, all becoming such a huge part of the rebellion and a symbol of defiance against the capital bringing the people together of Pan Am, you can really see now why all of this just brings a deeper hatred of Katniss for President Snow in the future, you know, all of this just reminds him of Lucy Gray Baird. The end of the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes even pulls a voiceover line from Mockingjay Part 1. When Katniss is trying to negotiate with President Snow to get PETA back, he says, It's the things we love most. I thought that was such a powerful line to pull from the original franchise, and it also takes on a deeper meaning when you know the impact that Lucy has had on him. Of course, we also got to mention some of the family history that shows up in this film. In addition to seeing younger versions of Coriolanus Snow and Tigris, we get to meet Arachne Crane at the Academy, who is a family member of Seneca Crane, who was the 74th annual Hunger Games game maker. We also get to meet the first ever host of the Hunger Games, Lucky Flickerman, who is a descendant of Caesar Flickerman. Flickermans. He's a Nepo baby, but we love to see it. They're both hilarious. And the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes even brings us into Heavensby Hall at the Academy, and we get a glimpse at one of the mentors, Hilarious Heavensby, and this is a reference to the ultra-rich family that the 75th annual Hunger Games game maker Plutarch Heavensby comes from. This was just such a great film, and I loved all the deeper meanings that we got to discover that were connected to the Hunger Games franchise. Let me know if you caught any other ones. Consider subscribing if you like my videos, and if you want to talk more TV and movies with me outside of the comments section, Section, check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash kmaldo. If you like this one, you can check out more of my videos right over here. See ya!